This episode of Liberty Lines is brought to you by... It is important to understand that the Constitution does not create rights for anyone. It simply serves as a grant of power to and a blueprint for the structure of the federal government. The rights of the people existed before the founding of the United States. You do not have constitutional rights. You just have rights. To protect them, you must understand them. The book, A Republic If You Can Keep It, can help you with that understanding. Available at patsanswers.com forward slash blog. Click on the store tab. $16.95 plus shipping and handling. All major credit cards are accepted. Buy it today. Welcome to Liberty Lines, episode 2-25, White Privilege. I'm your host, Pat Kansor. The notion of white privilege stems from the idea that white people have benefited in American history relative to people of color. And yet, this definition suffers from several shortcomings. For one, it ignores anti-Semitism, the second leading cause of hate crimes in America, according to the FBI. In addition, the growing demonization of whiteness now means that white people are no longer immune to racism. I can think of several instances where white people have been racially targeted for being white and holding contrarian but intellectually defensible positions, such as, we need to have reasonable limits on our immigration system, or even, I don't think racial minorities are systematically oppressed in Western society today. And the concept of white privilege can't explain why several historically marginalized groups outperform whites today. Take Japanese Americans, for example. For nearly four decades in the 20th century, 1913 through 1952, this group was legally prevented from owning land and property in over a dozen American states. Moreover, 120,000 Japanese Americans were interned during World War II. But by 1959, the income disparity between Japanese Americans and white Americans nearly vanished. Today, Japanese Americans outperform whites by large margins in income statistics, educational outcomes, test scores, and incarceration rates. One could argue the successful stories of Cuban Americans and Japanese Americans are cherry-picked cases. But whites are far from being the most dominantly successful group in Western society. A wealth of data collected shows overwhelming white underachievement relative to several minority groups among health outcomes, educational achievement, incarceration rates, and economic success. Interestingly, several black immigration groups, such as Nigerians, Barbadians, and Ghanaians, have a median household income well above the American average. Ghanaian Americans, to take one example, earn more than several specific white groups such as Dutch Americans, French Americans, Polish Americans, British Americans, and Russian Americans. Do Ghanaians have some kind of sub-Saharan African privilege? Nigerian Americans, meanwhile, are one of the most educated groups in America, as one Rice University survey indicates. Though they make up less than 1% of the black population in America, nearly 25% of the black student body at Harvard Business School in 2013 consisted of Nigerians. In post-bachelor education, 61% of Nigerian Americans over the age of 25 hold a graduate degree, compared to only 32% for the U.S. born population. These facts challenge the prevailing progressive notion that America's institution are built to universally favor whites and oppress minorities or blacks. On the whole, whatever systemic racism exists appears to be inc incredibly ineffectual, or even non-existent, given the multitude of groups who consistently eclipse whites. In fact, because whites are the majority in Canada and America, more white people live in poverty or are incarcerated than any other racial group in those countries. If you were to randomly pick an impoverished individual in America, you are exponentially more likely to pick a white person than a person of color. 
In simple terms, white privilege is a reaction to a racial construct, which is an idea or a theory about a race of people that is used by others to define or understand that group. How can someone not be racist but still have unconscious racial biases? Good question. This is largely due to what is referred to by those fostering the idea as institutional racism, a term that they say describes less obvious acts of racism or racial bias within social institutions like government and education. It is a way of separating people by color, alleged white privilege, or gender, alleged male privilege. It has been said that there's nothing new under the sun, and separating and scapegoating people because of their ethnic background has a long and destructive history. Before they took power in 1933, Hitler and the Nazi government set about implementing a series of four specific steps designed to result in complete and total dehumanization of Europe's Jewish population. The Nazi government actually fostered and promoted prejudice. According to the dictionary definition, prejudice is comprised of unreasonable feelings, opinions, or attitudes, especially of a hostile nature, regarding an ethnic, racial, social, or religious group. The Nazis scapegoated the Jews, blaming them for every societal problem in German society. They published an enormous quantity of propaganda that blamed the Jews for the wrongdoings, mistakes, or faults that plagued their civilization, and declared Jews and others untermenschen, or subhumans. These Nazi scapegoating tactics carried prejudice to the next step, from bigotry and bias to blaming. In the case of the Jews, the Nazis' prejudice against them made them easy to scapegoat. This naturally led to discriminatory laws by the government and caused violent acts against them that individuals could perpetrate with immunity. Jews were required to wear a yellow Star of David sewn onto their outerwear like a badge of shame, so others could see and avoid them. Or they could, if so moved, hurl epithets at them and even physically assault them with the awareness that they could do so without any consequences. Persecution of minorities isn't new. The persecution of the Christians by the Romans is one example. And another glaring case in point is the current situation in Iran. But the system created and utilized by the Nazis against the Jews was likely the most organized and efficient one in history up until today. Jews were forced from their homes, their valuables confiscated. They were crowded into ghettos. Homes, businesses, and temples were lost during Kristallnacht, a two-day pogrom, November 9th and 10th, 1938, commonly called the Night of the Broken Glass. But you might say that was back in the 1930s and the 1940s. We've come a long way since then, have we? Substitute the term white or Caucasian and or male for the word Jew and take a gander around at the society of the United States today. The television bombards us with gruesome images of those decimated by hunger and disease. But the faces and bodies of these concrete human beings become emblems, projections of our mind. The absolute novelty now is that the whites in Europe and the United States all belong to the wealthy class who curse each other, denounce the unbearable whiteness of our culture, and use the color of their skin to demonstrate their infamy. The hatred of the white man is, first of all, a hatred of oneself on the part of the rich white man who has internalized these accusations. The new scapegoat implies the deviation off course of three Western causes, feminism, anti-racism, and anti-colonialism. A vast re-education enterprise is underway at the university, in the media, asking those who are defined as white to deny themselves. If traditional feminism was universalist and intended to establish both economic and symbolic equality, neo-feminism is openly separatist, even supremacist, and pits the sexes against each other. 
the Me Too movement, iconoclastic enjoyment in demolishing certain known male figures, even if justice would have acquitted them. The feminism of progress has become the feminism of process. The anti-racism of the past defended the idea of a common humanity. The new anti-racism exacerbates identities, focuses on the color of your skin, and even resurrects the concept of race that was believed to have been abolished long ago. We denigrate the chalk faces, the whites, the crackers, to celebrate other skin colors by attributing every virtue to them. Anti-racism is paired with anti-colonialism, which is all the more delusional and virulent since colonialism no longer exists. We must decolonize Western countries from within, free them from historical and cultural prejudices. The last time we experienced racial propaganda like this was with fascism in the 1930s, where there was a disqualification of part of the population, in that case the Jews, in this case whites. We've been vaccinated, thank you, but it came back to us across the Atlantic disguised as racism. White people can do nothing right. Look at Amy Coney Barrett, accused of white colonialism for adopting two Haitian children. At the bottom of the hierarchy is the western white heterosexual male. At the top, black or Arab or Indian, lesbian or queer, the new queens of the universe. Thus all women are in danger in Damascus as in Beverly Hills and in Ghana as in Paris. According to the new prejudices, it would be better to be dark than pale, homosexual or transgender than heterosexual, women rather than men, Muslims rather than Jews or Christians, Africans, Asians, or natives rather than Westerners. And the media lend themselves very generously to this ideological makeup. The media guillotine is spinning at full speed. And like the other, it is thirsty for new heads to cut off. There are no more masterpieces. Only the works of the leaders of Western propaganda, from Cervantes to Faulkner. Will we have to rewrite all the classic tragedies, those of the Greeks or Shakespeare, because they incite femicide or assign a negative role to a non-white person like Othello? Fact checkers to work. The task is gigantic. The new gospel can be summed up by the phrase, if you're white, you ain't right. That's my take on it. What's yours? Share your thoughts by emailing me at librarian at patsanswers.com and share the link to this vlog with your friends. This has been Liberty Lines, Episode 2-25, White Privilege. I'm your host, Pat Cansor. Join us again next time.